as many of you know, for many years, we've had a lectureship uh, in, a, in the honor of Wade Volweiler. Uh, and over the years, <clears throat> we alternate between a hepatologist and a gastroenterologist for uh, the speakers for those. Thanks to a very generous contribution from one of our former liver transplant patients, Gino O'Connell, we're, John and I are very excited to announce that we're starting a new lectureship in which every year we'll have one of the top hepatologists in the world, and then the Walt Bowaller can bring one of the great gastroenterologists every year. So we'll double up on things. <clears throat> now, when it came time to choose who should be our inaugural speaker for this, it was an absolute no-brainer. Um, there's no question in my mind and the minds of most hepatologists in the world that the single best teacher in our profession is Dr. Chopra. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Chopra came to the United States in 1972, did an internship in a crummy hospital in New Jersey, then went to Harvard in 1973 and never stopped looking back after that. He's won every teaching award at Harvard. <clears throat> For the last 10 years, he's been head of the Harvard Continuing Medical Education Program, the largest medical education program in the world. And he's the editor of all the liver sections and up to date. Um, he's won the Distinguished Teaching Award from the American Gastroenterological Association, and he's a Master of the American College of Physicians, the highest award you can get from that organization. <clears throat> What really separates Sanjeev from the rest of us, however, is he's transcended hepatology. And he's now moved on <clears throat> to more, more important uh, topics, uh, specifically leadership. He's written a book on leadership. He meets with Fortune 500 companies on leadership. And his new passion is happiness. And I am delighted to share for all of us to hear what Sanjeev has to say about happiness. Sanjeev, we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Mark. <clears throat> Thank you so very much for that kind introduction. I'm truly privileged, honored, and humbled to be here this morning and to address with you, share with you some reflections about something I'm very passionate about. So this talk is entitled Dharma Happiness and Living with Purpose. We're having a bit of a color issue, but I think you can still see the slides. Yeah, Donna, you can see them? Okay, terrific. <clears throat> so what is dharma? And how did I discover my dharma? So I was 12 years of age. I was studying at St. Columbus High School in New Delhi. My brother was two years ahead of me. We were staying with our uncle and aunt. My father, a brilliant cardiologist, was stationed 300 miles away. It was a very warm, sultry weekend. I played a cricket match. And then on Sunday evening, I'm reading. I'm a little tired, and I take a nap. And I wake up, and I'm blind. So I nudge my brother. I said, Deepak, I can't see. And he probably did visual threat and reckoned that I wasn't faking it. So he started to cry. He said, I want brother and he's turned blind. They took me to the hospital where the doctors examined me, including, I believe, an ophthalmologist. And they didn't have the foggiest idea as to what was going on. I could hear them talking, something about hysteria. And I was this happy kid. I was a pretty good student, a very good athlete. Finally, they get a hold of my father. He was stationed 300 miles away, as I mentioned. This is 1961, one of those long distance phone calls. And my father very calmly said, tell me everything that's happened to Sanjeev in the last two months. They said, he's been well. He said, no, any injuries, any medications? Oh yes, he had a laceration to his left leg about four or five days ago. We took him to the casualty ward, he got stitches. He probed further. Did he get an antibiotic? They looked in the records and said, yes. He said, did you give him a tetanus shot? And they said, yes. And he said, what kind? Anti-tetanus serum, ATS, or anti-tetanus toxoid, ATT? So they looked in the records and they said, anti-tetanus serum. 
And I have no idea how my father divined it, but he said to them, Sanjeev is having a rare idiosyncratic reaction to the anti-tetanus serum. It occurs less than one in a million. He has severe bilateral optic neuritis. He has a localized form of serum sickness. Start in intravenous and give him massive doses of corticosteroids. So they did that, and about seven, eight hours later, my vision returned. I've told this story to professors of ophthalmology around the country, Mass Annie at Harvard Med School, and they are absolutely befuddled, but also duly impressed. It was on that day that I had the inkling that my dharma was to become a physician in the footsteps of my father. So the word dharma is, in essence, right action, duty, ethos, moral compass, authenticity, truth. We all have a dharma. Many of you are in medicine or nursing. We have a dharma to our patients. We have a dharma to our family. We have a dharma to our society, to our church, our synagogue, our temple. I'm going to tell you another story about dharma, which illustrates that dharma can change, can change very quickly. This is a story of Lakshman Singh. About 40 years ago, in a remote village, a poor farmer in the foothills of the Himalayas. And the Indian government has gone and inoculated everyone, pretty much everyone, against smallpox. There are a few holdouts. He's one of them. He says, you cannot inoculate me or my family. God ordains who will be diseased, who will be healthy. So they're stymied. They don't know what to do. They discuss it. They have somebody from the World Health Organization. And they make the decision that we're going to go to his hut tomorrow morning, early in the morning. We're going to take the police with us. If he resists, we'll pin him to the ground and inoculate him. So they go early in the morning. And he again says, you cannot inoculate me or my family. God ordains will be diseased or healthy. So they pin him to the ground, rip his shirt, jab him with a needle. His wife is screaming. The kids are screaming. They all get inoculated. The whole village is awake. And he turns to the team and he says, please sit down. He turns to his wife and says, make tea for them. And he goes to the back of his little hut. There's a little vegetable plot, pluts the juiciest, ripest cucumbers, radishes, washes it, and is serving it to them. And they go, oh my God, what are you doing? We invaded your home, we forcibly inoculated you, and you're treating us like royalty. And this uneducated farmer said, I believed God ordains will be diseased or he healthy. I refused the inoculation. I upheld my dharma. You obviously believed it was your dharma to forcibly inoculate me. Now it is over, and you're a guest in my home. This is the least that I can offer to you. So to me, that tells us we can have a dharma to a patient, and the next thing, that person has a cardiac arrest, they aspirate, and now we have to make the decision. Talk to the family. This is a patient with metastatic cancer. What do we do? Our dharma two hours earlier was totally different than what it is now. I'm also going to make the case that dharma, happiness, and living with purpose are inextricably linked. So let's talk about happiness and make a distinction between happiness, joy, and bliss. So the happiness is the sensation of feeling good. It's an internal experience, but we express it outwardly. We smile. Joy is much more intense. It's much more exuberant, but it's temporary. And bliss is what we see in children all the time, right? Playing on the playground, they fall, they cry, they get up, and two minutes later, they're back in bliss. It's the experience of intense joy, but it's anchored by a sense of connectedness with others and with nature. So all the research has shown that meaningful experiences surpass the acquisition of expensive possessions. You buy a brand new Tesla, 
or move into a huge mansion. You'll be happy for a few months. It's a car. It's a home. It's a house. And you adapt to it. This phenomenon is called hedonic adaptation. In contrast, if you win the lottery, a year later, all the studies have shown that that lottery winner is back to baseline. Sometimes they're less happy than they were before they won the 20 million. Their friends and their relatives have come out of the woodwork, demanded they pay their mortgage. Many of them have purchased expensive objects, which, as we know, doesn't give you lasting happiness. Some have gambled it away. The only people who are happy once they win the lottery are those who give away a certain amount to charity and partake in meaningful experiences. So how many of you have had a recent vacation? Wonderful. How many of you have a vacation coming up? All right. I want to know what's wrong with the rest of you. <laughs> now, who has a vacation coming up? All right. I look around. Everyone who has a vacation coming up who raised their hand has a big smile on their face. <laughs> right? This is, I call it the future, present, and past. Just anticipating the vacation, you'll be happy. When you're there, be mindful. Enjoy the sunset, the sunrise, the companionship, the discussions with your friends, strangers whom you meet. My plea, especially to young people, is don't take 1,600 selfies. That's not the way to be in the moment. And when you come back, your friends will ask you, how's your vacation? And you'll be reminiscing and you'll be smiling about it. We've talked about what happens to lottery winners. One of the worst fates that can befall a human being is to break your neck and become a quadriplegic. And that happened to Christopher Reeves, Superman, taking part in an equestrian competition. He fell, he broke his neck. He's a quadriplegic. And for the first two or three months, he's not happy, he's unhappy. There's always, why me? But at the end of a year, this is what he said. He said, I'm not living the life I thought I would lead, but it does have meaning. It has purpose. There is love. There is joy. There is laughter. Human beings are amazingly resilient. I think many of you will know of family or friends who've really gone through hell. And now, looking back, they consider that a gift. Adversity is the gift. Norman Rosenthal, best-selling author, has written a book called The Gift of Adversity. Rabindranath Tagore wrote a series of poems in his native language, Bengali, in 1912. It's called Gitanjali. And in 1913, he translated it himself into English. And he got the Nobel Prize in Literature. His poetry is beautiful. It's spiritual. And he once said, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. We are in the most amazing profession where we have the privilege to be serving our patients. We serve for many, many years, three, four decades. We come on the weekend, we're on call, we come at two in the morning, to take care of an emergency. It's an amazing privilege. Some ancient reflections. Socrates believed that his wisdom and insights arose merely in knowing that he knew nothing. He also argued that happiness was not bestowed upon a select few, nobility, kings, sports, philosophers. That was the prevailing view. He said, no, this can be begotten by human endeavor and that happiness and virtue are inextricably linked. In fact, the ancient Greeks did not use the word happiness. They used a term called eudaimonia, which literally translated means human flourishing. When you're happy, you flourish. So my research, my reflections, I've come to the conclusion that the happiest people on this planet have four things in common. 
The first one is that they have a cadre of good friends. Of course, your family can be your best friends. But your friends are truly your chosen family. I have an amazing brother. I had the most amazing parents. I didn't get to choose them. But I get to choose my friends. A friend is a gift that you give to yourself. Thoreau once said, friends, they cherish one another's hopes. They are kind to one another's dreams. Robert Louis Stevenson, friend is a gift you give to yourself. And Khalil Gibran once said, friendship is a sweet responsibility, never an opportunity. So have a cadre of good friends. Celebrate everything, small or big with them. Somebody gets a poster accepted, national meeting, an article published, a promotion an award, just call them. Go for a cup of coffee, go for a beer, go for lunch, celebrate it. There's a best-selling author by the name of James Rohn. And he has a wonderful statement. He says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Just think about that. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose your friends carefully. Right, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my, friend, my favorites, once said, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, great minds discuss ideas. Choose your friends with whom you can partake in wonderful events and you can discuss ideas. This is an amazing study that is still ongoing. It's called the Happiness Grant Study. It's been going on for 77 years. Robert Waldinger, a psychiatrist, professor of psychiatry at Harvard Med School, is now the fourth principal investigator. So they recruited several hundred college students at Harvard. And then as a comparison, they had poor kids from Dorchester and West Roxbury in Boston. They followed them. 19 of them are still alive. They're in their 90s. Annual questionnaires, home visits, physical examinations, blood pressure, CRP, cholesterol. Then they started to interview their spouses. And the uh, Harvard College graduates said, why are you interviewing our spouses? The others said, about time. <laughs> Some of these individuals became physicians, lawyers. Some became alcoholics. Few committed suicide. One of the individuals in this cohort was John F. Kennedy. The criticism about the study is that it was all young white men. So we can't necessarily generalize. But the seminal conclusion of the study is that loneliness is toxic and that the happiest people are those who have connectedness with friends, that social fabric. And your satisfaction with your relationships with friends at age 50 is a better predictor of longevity and happiness three decades later at age 80. It's an amazing study. And if you like TED Talks, watch the TED Talk by Robert Waldinger about this, wonderful talk. And George Valiant, who was one of the principal investigators, also a professor of psychiatry at Mass General, Harvard Med School, has written a wonderful book all about this study. It's called The Triumph of Experience. The second trait of the happiest people on this planet is the ability to forgive. If you harbor resentment or bitterness, you cannot be happy. My plea to anyone in this room, if you're holding a grudge, let go. The person you're holding a grudge against is oblivious. He or she has moved on. It's like the Buddha once said, resentment is like holding a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at the person who offended you. That person's moved on. You're burning your hand. And to me, the prime example of not harboring resentment is Nelson Mandela. 27 years in prison? Can you imagine 27 hours or days or weeks? And when he's released, he's asked the question, Mr. Mandela, do you have a resentment against your captors? He gave the most beautiful answer. He said, I have no bitterness. I have no resentment. 
Resentment is like drinking poison than hoping it will kill your enemies. He also said, as I walked out to freedom after 27 years in jail, I looked back at my cell and I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison, right? The prison of the mind, the negativity. Mahatma Gandhi once said, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Gandhi also led by example. There's a story about this lady who trudges 40 miles from a village with her 12 year old son. And she says, Gandhiji, my son adores you. He worships you. He's eating a lot of sugar and he's gaining weight. Would you please tell him not to eat sugar? So Gandhi looks at the boy, looks at the mother, and he says, come back in three weeks. So they go away, they trudge another 40 months, three weeks later. Gandhi looks at the boy and he says, son, don't eat sugar. It's not good for you. And the boy says, Gandhiji, I'll do anything you say. And he leaves. And the mother comes back and she says, Gandhiji, thank you for saying that. But we were here three weeks ago. Couldn't you have said the same thing to my son there? <laughs> Gandhi whispers into her ear. He says, at that time, I had not given up sugar. <laughs> <laughs> St. Francis of Assisi, the joyful beggar. Right? He once said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Wow. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. So what's the third trait? Albert Schweitzer, physician, theologian, humanitarian, Nobel laureate. 1952, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Talk about humility. At the ceremony in Oslo, he says, now I have to go earn it. Now I have to go earn it. The Beth Israel Hospital where I work is a sister hospital of the hospital he and his wife and nurse started in Gabon, Africa. There's an Albert Schweitzer Fellowship around our country, and it's more difficult now to be an Albert Schweitzer Fellow than to get into a good college. They do amazing seminal work. But Schweitzer once said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I'm certain of, the ones amongst you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. So I've distilled it into three Fs. Friends, forgiveness for others. You do these three things, you're bound to be happy. But there's a fourth one, and it begins with G. And it's not God. What is it? You know it. Don't be afraid to be right. Gratitude, gratefulness. Right? The word gratitude is derived from the Latin root gratia, meaning grace, graciousness, gratefulness, highly prized tenet in all the major religions. I'm defining gratitude as the experience of something positive gain, but coupled with the realization somebody else was, that, was responsible for that. I'm so grateful to be here today. This is my third day and another day tomorrow, four days. It's full of wonder and it's full of meeting amazing young future leaders and doctors. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity. I have to thank you, Bob, for inviting me. I'm also convinced that gratitude, like compassion, can be cultivated. This is a landmark study called the Catholic Nun Study. So there are about 180 nuns who joined the Notre Dame convent in about 1930. And the mother superior said to everyone, on a piece of paper, write down a little bit about your background, what you're looking forward to. So handwritten, the researchers could authenticate that these were handwritten. And they codified their statements into low or neutral gratitude and high gratitude. I'm not going to read it, but you can see the second one, the very words of happy, eager joy are inscribed. So they're all 22 years of age. No one's married. Nobody drinks. Nobody smokes. They eat the same food. What happens? The nuns on average who expressed high gratitude lived 10 years longer. 10 years longer. This has been duplicated in some other studies. It's called the Catholic Nun Study. Positive emotional content in early life autobiography strongly associated with longevity six decades later. 
Here's a small study from Harvard Ed School. Christina Hinton, happiness positively associated with both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation in children in grades four to 12. Also with a higher GPA. This is something that was taught to me by my younger granddaughter. I have two amazing granddaughters, Anya and Mira, they're 12 and 10. They live in New York, they're the joy of my life. And they were visiting in Boston. Yeah, Mira at that time was seven years of age, so about three years ago. And we sit down for dinner and she says, Nana, which means maternal grandfather, we're gonna play a little game. I said, okay, what's it called? She said, it's called Hans, Buds and Roses. I said, I don't know what that means. She said, I'll explain. She said, my cousin was coming for a play date. Her father got busy. She couldn't come. That's my thorn. My bud is she's coming tomorrow. And my roses are, you took us this morning for breakfast. Then you took us to a bookstore. You got me three books. And tonight after dinner, Nana, you're going to tell some amazing stories. Horns, buds, and roses. You can do this with your children, with your nieces, nephews. You can do it as adults. So it takes two minutes. It's very important, though, that the number of roses exceed the number of thorns. This is a very interesting ratio. It's close to three. This is called the Losada ratio. Marcia Losada's research led to this. It's the ratio of positive expressions to negative expressions. And this ratio has been found to be highly predictive of success in companies as judged by metrics such as profitability. And three to six is a good ratio. One, you're in the danger zone. And if you're in 11, you're also in the danger zone. My contention is that these are probably people who are manic. They haven't been diagnosed and treated yet. <laughs> but this is true for college students, nursing home residents, managers, business teams. So negativity is very heavily weighted. If you say something negative to an individual, you now have to say at least three positive things simply to neutralize it. You say something negative to your spouse, you have to say six positive things. <laughs> right? Your language should be very important. When I was the faculty dean for CMA at HMS, I had an open door policy. Somebody could knock, walk in. And often they'd come and say, Dr. Chopra, we have a problem. And I'd say, please sit down. You want coffee, water? But let's rephrase it. We have a challenge. Use the word challenge. You want to rise up and come up with a solution. Use the word problem. You get weighted. It's negative. So some ancient reflections in emerging science about gratitude and happiness. Cicero said, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. G.K. Chesterton, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness, doubled by wonder. And Gertner, to speak gratitude is courteous and pleasant, to enact gratitude is generous and noble, but to live gratitude is to touch heaven. As in many things in life, there happens to be a happiness formula. And this is based on the studies of monozygotic twins and comparing them to dizygotic twins. And what it says is that 50% of our happiness is genetic. And you know families where there are two brothers and one is always happy and the other is not that happy. Astoundingly, only 10% is living conditions. Whether you live in a Bill Gates mansion or the slums of Calcutta or the shanty towns of Joburg. As long as you have a roof, running water, you're happy. Only 10% living conditions. And 40% is voluntary action. What we do to serve others, to make others happy, to have some meaning and purpose in our lives. You know, one of the best ways, of course, to be happy is to make others happy. But even this set point of 50% can be modulated. And how do we modulate that? You know it. Exercise, behavioral cognitive therapy, meditation and expressing gratitude. <clears throat> Robert Emmons, the father of modern positive psychology, has written a wonderful book called Thanks. And he talks about studies where people who express gratitude for six weeks and the control doesn't do it. 
Every day, think of five things you're grateful for, write it down. And that set point goes up by an astounding 25%. So very simple, you can have a gratitude journal. Every Sunday, sit down and reflect on what's happened to you in the preceding six days and write it down. I'm grateful for one, two, three, four, five. Just see what will happen to you in the next month. If you're not doing it, many, many people actually do this. Here's a wonderful book called The Power of Thanks, How Social Recognition Empowers Employees and Creates the Best Place to Work. Google, a couple of years ago, decided to take their top managers and instead of giving them a bonus of $100,000 or $200,000, arrange for a wonderful vacation in Costa Rica. Bring your significant other. They met, they networked, they went to the rainforest. It cost Google $18,000 per one of these managers compared to the $100,000 or $200,000 bonus. And when these people were asked, how do you compare this with the last year when you got a bonus, unanimously, this was far better. Again, social connectedness, making new friends, learning what other people do in this wonderful organization. Here's another study, Counting Blessings Versus Burdens, an experimental investigation of gratitude, subjective well-being in daily life. And here's one about heart disease. What's the number one time in our country people have heart attacks? Which day of the week? Monday, right? Which part of Monday? Monday morning. You know who published this article? Bernie Lau, cardiologist, professor of medicine, also a Nobel laureate for physicians against nuclear armament. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine some 40 years ago. So people are going to work, maybe they ate too much, drank too much on the weekend, had a poor score in golf, and they're in traffic, they don't like their boss, the adrenaline kicks in, platelets get sticky, you have a heart attack. Victor Frankl. Holocaust Survivor, one of the best books you can ever read, Man's Search for Meaning. He said, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue as the unintended side effect of dedication to a cause greater than yourself. And Albert Schweitzer said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. Thich Nhat Hanh, Vietnamese monk, was a keynote speaker for us at the Harvard Medical School CME course. He's the picture of serenity and compassion. When Martin Luther King Jr. met him many, many decades ago, he was so impressed, he nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize. And Thich Nhat Hanh once said, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. This is one of my favorites, John Lennon. The Beatle is five years of age, he goes to school. And the teacher gives the kids an assignment, write down what you want to be when you grow up. He writes happy and he hands it to the teacher. And the teacher says, John, you didn't understand the assignment. John looks up and he says, you don't understand life. <laughs> right? Five years of age. There's a wonderful anonymous quote. If you've forgotten the language of gratitude, you will never be on speaking terms with happiness. So I decided, you know, C knows the answer to every question. So I went to my iPhone a couple of years ago and I said, Siri, what's the secret to happiness? And the answer came back, it is unequivocally chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making this up. Two days later, I'm invited to give a keynote to the Rochester Chamber of Commerce. And I'm also going to Mayo Clinic and meet with Jack Gross, good friend and colleague of ours, hepatologist. So I get my coffee early in the morning and I leave and there's a chocolate shop next to that coffee place. And there's a sign that says, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy chocolate. It's kind of like happiness. <laughs> so I've asked a lot of my friends, colleagues to complete the sentence, happiness is. And see what they say. Being in the moment and being grateful. Again, gratitude. Breaking bread with friends. Again, friends. A choice. Knowing you have been good to others. When my nest is full, when my kids return home and are asleep in their own beds. No clinging, no grasping, no regrets, no anticipation. Just being in the moment as it is. 
being content with what you have, putting, putting a smile on a stranger's face each day. The last two, I gave a talk at Assumption College in Worcester, Massachusetts, this talk. And one of the deans sent me an email five days later. She said, Dr. Chopra, thank you for sharing your slides. I shared them with my husband. We went over your talk. But I took your cue and asked my five-year-old daughter, what is happiness? And my five-year-old daughter said, Mommy, happiness is when the heart feels bigger. The kids get it. We grow up and we become adults and we're jaded. And if I ask, you ask me the question, I want to be smart, intellectual, witty. And then I gave it at surgical grand rounds at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And the program director reached out to me and we met. He said, uh, Sanjeev, I asked my three-year-old son, what makes you happy? And he says, Daddy, I'm most happy when I'm sharing my toys with my friends. So talking about kids, in which country do these kids live? Anyone? Tibet, you're close. Bhutan. And what's so unique about Bhutan? What's unique is that about 30 years ago, the ruler said, we're not going to care about GDP. We're going to look at, we're going to track gross national happiness. They have a ministry of happiness. And year after year after year, amongst the 12 happiest countries is Bhutan. Denmark has been the happiest country in the last 10 years, about eight times. Just two weeks ago, it was Norway. But it's Denmark, Norway, Australia, Bhutan, Austria, Costa Rica, Singapore, Switzerland, Sweden, Canada, Iceland, New Zealand. You notice the United States is not there. We're like 22, 24, 18. But something very strange happened in 2014. <coughs> the only country on this slide that was there in 2014 was Costa Rica. And all the 12 countries were Latin America. Number one was Paraguay. Number two was Colombia. And I have only one conclusion. I think for the first time, they asked the questionnaire in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a very interesting phenomenon that occurs in Denmark. Huga. So friends drop in, unannounced, and they sit down, and they reminisce. They have a cup of hot cocoa, and they talk about life. Informal gathering, in a setting that is cozy, comfortable, and convivial. It also turns out they work 35 hours a week. They have free education. They have free health care. And many of them live in communes. So 10 families. One mother has to cook only once in 10 days. That's a formula for happiness. <laughs> right? The others help out. But the kids think they have eight other cousins. And some of the families have grandparents. And they regale them with stories. A very interesting phenomenon is occurring right now. There are some day schools, you know, uh, preschool, that have been coupled with nursing homes. And both the children and the nursing home residents are happy. It's, it's like having a surrogate grandparent telling them a story. So let's move on. We've talked about dharma, happiness, and what about living with purpose? Montaigne, the French philosopher, the great and glorious masterpiece of man is to live with purpose. Now, defining your purpose can come by reflecting on it, and you don't force it, it'll come to you, or by virtue of a key moment in your life. Sometimes that moment is harsh, it's jolting, but it's momentous. And the people who have fortitude and grit and courage say, you know what, this is unacceptable. I'm going to try and make a difference here. And they devote their lives to it. Most of us will experience sorrow. When you experience the abyss of sorrow and emerge stronger, and with a clear sense of purpose, you will have triumphed. Look at Viktor Frankl again. He said, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, 
to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. The Buddha once said, every life has a measure of sorrow. Sometimes it is this that awakens us. Now I'm very privileged to have met, and I consider him a friend and a mentor. I actually met him at a leadership course at Kellogg seven or eight years ago. He's from the country Colombia. His name is Jaime Aramillo, but he's a national hero, hence the term Papa Jaime. And his story is that at age 28, so about 38 years ago, he's standing at a street corner in Bogota. And across the street, there's a sewer. And there are these orphans who live there. He's seeing, feeling sorry for their plight. There's a seven-year-old beautiful girl smiling at him. As they're having this interchange, a car comes around the corner, stops in the middle of the street, a window rolls down, somebody tosses a toy. The car recedes, the seven-year-old girl comes running up to the middle of the street. She's never owned a toy. And she's smiling and looking at Jaime Aramillo. As they're having this interchange, a truck comes around the corner <clears throat> and smashes her into oblivion. And he says to himself, this is my calling in life. I'm going to take care of these kids. He has adopted house, school, and fed 52,000 orphans. So I said, Papa, how do you pay for this? How many staff do you have? He said, Sanjeev, I have a bakery. The only thing we make is cookies. I've convinced all the restaurants in Bogota, Medellin, to put a next to the cash register a cookie jar, next to a shoe box with a slit. People grab a cookie, drop change. I get 50% of my needs that way. I said, wonderful. What about the other 50%? He said, I'm a motivational speaker. I speak all over Latin America. I plow my honorarium into the foundation. I said, come on. I know that as not it. He says, you're right. The rest comes. When I need money, it comes. I said, tell me. He says, uh, three weeks ago, I needed 41,000 US dollars. So I go to three banks. They turn me down. The so, Papa Jaime, we love the work you do. You've got loans with us. We can't give you more. So he's coming back to the office and there's a street woman. Says, Papa Jaime gives him a hug and he says, are you hungry? She says, yes. He says, come to the office, have coffee and cookies. So she's in the office having coffee and cookies and he's on the phone calling three other bankers. And she can tell that he's being turned down. So she looks at him and she says, how much money do you need? He says, Sanjeev, I told her I need 41,000 US dollars. She smiles and says, I'll give it to you. So I said to myself, she's cuckoo. When she opened her purse, she had $60,000. Son had sent her the money to get off the street, move into her house. She said, I've saved some other money. I'm okay on the street. You need it. Your children need it. Take it now. No questions asked. You can return it if you want, when you want. So that kind of thing happens to me all the time. He also showed me the photograph of a young lady with third degree burns on the entire left side of her body. One of his orphans knew to the orphanage. She crept outside and was begging outside a fancy restaurant. And the restaurant owner called the police. It was not the police. It was the death squad. Took her back to the ghetto and torched her. He rescued her 17 reconstructive surgeries. She then came to our country on a scholarship, computer sciences. Is back home, is married, has a three-year-old. And Papa Jaime said to me, Sanjeev, that's my grandchild. That three-year-old plays with my biological grandchildren. The next moment, he showed me the photograph of this handsome young guy dressed in impeccable white with a tennis racket, flanked by Pete Sampras on one side and Agassi on the other, junior national champion for tennis in the country, Colombia. Children have grown up to become computer scientists, professional athletes, teachers, nurses, surgeons, accountants, and many are giving back to the foundation. But he found his purpose in life with that one interaction, that tragic death of that beautiful seven-year-old girl. Jim Collins once said, the good to great leaders never wanted to become larger-than-life heroes. They never aspired to be put on a pedestal or become these unreachable icons. They were seemingly ordinary people, quietly producing extraordinary results. Margaret Mead one said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. One of my favorites, Joseph Campbell, who wrote about the power of 
myth, a hero's journey. He once said, follow your bliss and doors will open where there were no doors before. The Papa Haimis of the world are following their bliss. Now here's a remarkable individual. Some of you may have heard of him. He's from the country Venezuela. He's an economist. And 30 years ago, he decided to do an interesting experiment. He took nine kids off the street, taught them classical music. There are now 400,000 children in Venezuela playing classical music. 90% of these kids come from poor families. They'd be on drugs. They'd be in gangs. They might be dead. A troupe recently performed in Vienna. And the critics said, this is the performance of the year. El Sistema, 400,000 kids. Now it's occurring in... Last year at the proms, here in the Royal Albert Hall, something amazing happened. A huge orchestra of kids from the shanty towns of Venezuela came to play Shostakovich's 10th symphony. One critic called it the performance of the season so far. It was an astonishing proms debut for one of the most remarkable orchestras in the world. I would say in my experience that there is no more important work being done in music now than is being done in Venezuela. <laughs> The person you see on the screen here is Gustavo Dudamel, conductor of the LA Philharmonic. He's one of the kids, became the conductor at age 26. So it's being duplicated in LA, it's being duplicated in Boston and Scotland, many Scandinavian countries. A brew found his purpose in life. I didn't think he knew it was going to be this huge <coughs> uh, by teaching classical music to nine kids. Abru was honored with a doctorate at Harvard University a couple of years ago. The only other person on that occasion was Oprah Winfrey. This is my favorite quote for this talk, Mark Twain. The two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Each one of us has a singular purpose in life. Sir Ken Robinson, who lives in California, written a wonderful book called Finding Your Element and finding your purpose. He says, having a purpose in life is the wellspring of sustained happiness. Now, here are five things you see on the screen. I should have said I love you more often. I should have had the courage to pursue my dreams and aspirations. I should have traveled more. I should have been the bigger person and said, I'm sorry. I should have spent more time with my friends. Who says this? You know it. People in hospice. You're asked, what are your greatest regrets in life? These are the greatest regrets. Nobody says I should have worked harder. Should have lived in a bigger mansion. Should have owned a new Tesla every six months. Right? The point of this is, let's make sure we're doing it now. Let's not have this regret on our deathbed. I'm going to conclude with the story of Adam Braun. Adam Braun, <coughs> studying at Brown University, <coughs> he does a semester at sea. And he decides on a lark, you know, I'm going to pick an eight, seven-year-old, nine-year-old kid off the street and ask them one question, often through an interpreter. If you could have one wish in the world, what would it be? So he meets this eight-year-old girl in an African country, and she says to dance. He says, come on. She didn't get the question. Ask the question again. She repeats it. Another African country, another eight-year-old girl, she says, for my mother to be healthy and walk me to school. And he goes to India, and he meets an eight-year-old beggar, a boy. And through the interpreter, you can have one wish in the world, what would it be? And the boy says, a pencil. He says, what? He sees these kids come out of school. They sit on the wall next to him. They open their notebooks. They're writing, they're drawing, they're happy. He thinks, this beggar thinks, his ticket to happiness is a pencil. So Adam Braun buys a bunch of pencils, and every other country he goes, he doles out pencils on the street to kids. And he comes back to New York, 
is haunted by the image of this eight-year-old beggar. All he wanted was a pencil. So he starts a foundation called Promise of a Pencil. His goal is to build one school in Africa. He has now built 200 schools across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Forbes magazine has listed him as one of the most influential people in the world under the age of 30 years. Some years ago, he was invited to a rooftop in Manhattan, and everyone is older than him, and this elderly gentleman walks up to him and he says, young man, what do you do? He says, I have a nonprofit, and before he could complete the sentence, the guy snubs his nose and walks away. And as he's walking away, he says, sir, can I have your card? So the guy gives him his card, and he reflects on it, and he writes to him, emails him, and says, would you please spare me 15 minutes and have a cup of coffee with me? And the guy agrees. They sit down, and he turns to him, and he says, I don't have a nonprofit. I have a for-purpose organization. So you use the word nonprofit, there's negative connotations. 70% is going to overhead. The CEO is making $1.3 million for purpose. And the guy takes out his checkbook and writes him a check for $20,000. His grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. Oddly, her name is Eva Braun. A couple of years ago, she was 92. Adam had got a job with Bain Consulting in Boston, very high end job. And she says, Adam, I was so proud of you. You're working for Bain, you quit. What is this pencil thing you're doing? And he calls her Ma. He says, Ma, sit down with me. Goes to his computer. I'm going to show you three slides. First slide is these poor kids in an African country playing in the dirt. Second is a spanking new school. First school he built. And the third, as you walk into the lobby, there's a plaque. It says, this school is dedicated to Ma, Eva Braun. And then the two of them saw. It's a wonderful book, Promise of the Pencil. I'm going to conclude by sharing with you my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to fulfill my dharma, to teach medicine, leadership, and happiness, to do it grounded in humility and with an ardent desire to learn every single day, to celebrate with gratitude my family, friends, colleagues, and students who inspire me in countless ways. And in some small measure, attempt to inspire everyone that I meet. I invite you to reflect on what gives you the greatest joy. What resonates for you? Take a few minutes now or later, write it down. You may wish to share it with your closest friends or your family. It is my fervent hope that you will find lasting happiness and it will light up every day of your life. Thank you very much.